Uh, thank you. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here. I want to thank the organizers, uh, the KMDI and uh, UT, for their very kind uh, invitation. Uh, Gail, in uh, her introduction to this session, offered two uh, definitions of a social movement uh, from a sociologist's point of view. Uh, and as you recall, they were differentiated primarily by the question of intention. Is a social movement uh, a, uh, an intentional effort at the changing organizations and power relations, uh, or is it uh, a, a, an un, a conscious parallelism uh, only to the extent uh, that the immediate aims of the movement, uh, the immediate goals at any given moment are known to those who participate in it. Uh, I'm here uh, to speak uh, today on behalf of the conspiracy. Um, free software is about freedom, and freedom is something which is sought consciously by people. It is also something which is withheld consciously from people. And accordingly, the search for freedom has been, in the history of the West, a history of conflict. We, by which I mean the Free Software Foundation and the Free Software Movement, recognize that there is a condition of conflict. There are those for whom withdrawing freedom from people is profitable or pleasant. There always are. There tends, after there has been a change in the direction of freedom, to be a sort of amnesia on the part of those who participated in withholding freedom. We were not in favor of racial segregation. That was other people. We are glad that freedom has progressed to the point where there is nominal racial equality in our town, where there used to be two water fountains and the like. Similarly, of course, there will come a time when there is nobody left who remembers that it was the policy of their organizations at the opening of the 21st century to deprive people of technological freedom in the interest of profit. There will come a time when there is nobody left who will sign up for the proposition that, yes, indeed, I wanted people not to be able to understand, learn from, fix, improve, or share the technology that ran their lives because it was making me rich to keep them unfree. Soon, and I do mean soon, the number of people willing to admit that, yes, I sold the privilege of human communications to people by the SIP, rather than acknowledging their right to be in touch with one another, and it made me money, and I grew rich, will go down. There will be fewer people who will admit that they were the beneficiaries of the old regime, my job, as I understand it, is to bring them to that condition of virtue, the minimum condition of virtue, in which they have forgotten their history of vice as quickly as possible. That's not just my job. That's your job, too. We're doing it. And unlike much of the long history of the struggle for freedom, this time we win. You notice that we're already winning. It has not been my role in this movement to go places and tell people winning was possible before it happened. That work was done by my friend, my colleague, Richard Stallman, who spent his entire adult life telling people it was possible, as a result of which it became possible. I'm not the visionary, I'm just the lawyer. <laughs> it was kind of Brian to mention PGP, I thought, as the beginning. Phil Zimmerman deserves a little bit more credit on that subject than he got. On the evening in July of 1990, when PGP first entered the net, 
Uh, that net was a FIDO bulletin board network, not the Internet. Uh, I saw PGP arrive in the net, and I uh, took a look at the software, and I took a look at the user's manual, and I wrote an unsolicited email to Phil Zimmerman. I said, congratulations, you're going to change the world. You're also going to get in a lot of trouble. Although I used a profane expression to describe the amount of the trouble. <laughs> I said, when it happens, call me, and I explained who I was and why I thought I might be able to help. And I was about two weeks ahead of the nice policeman from the Customs Service and the not-so-nice policeman from the FBI who turned up in Boulder, Colorado, to begin the trouble. So we spent nearly two years abating that trouble for Phil. And as you notice, there are very few people left who want to admit that keeping security out of the world financial system was their aim. They have begun to suffer amnesia on the subject of strong encryption. They were not against it. They were cautiously for it. <laughs> In order to reach that point, mind you, we had to defeat an alliance of the spooks and the cops in the world's dominant empire which had maintained it would never be moved on these subjects, ever. And for years, there were certain people I met on the circuit who began their talks by asking me whether I was still in favor of pedophilia and nuclear terrorism. But, of course, we got the freedom to keep secrets, which is now primarily used by every bank and every brokerage and every financial intermediary in the world, but which, as Brian points out, is also keeping people alive. Free software, that is, software that can be freely copied, modified, and redistributed by its users, is the sine qua non of civil freedom in the 21st century. Civil freedom in the 21st century requires human beings to retain control over the technological environment that surrounds them. Without that control, they live in a world of perfect surveillance conducted perfectly all the time on behalf of whoever it is who does control the technology that they do not control. So you are given an automobile, and you are told, here, here's a dandy little button you can push if you get into trouble on the road. Just push the button, and roadside assistance will be summoned. And then we learn that a major U.S. automaker enters into a deal with the police to permit, under certain circumstances, the button to be pushed without your knowing it, and for you to be connected not to the helpful roadside service people, but to the police so they can hear what's going on inside your automobile. Spyware, as you're aware, has suddenly become an issue of which people are aware in the United States. A year or two from now, people will be forgetting that they were for spyware, you know? Oh, no, we, no, we, we, we have now forgotten that we used to be the people who made money by surveilling users of the net through a machinery that we implanted on them without telling them what it did. They will have forgotten that because it will be made illegal hastily and clumsily and with all sorts of unintended consequences by legislatures suddenly outraged at this theft of freedom from people. But this is for our purposes, you and me, a reminder of the extent to which civic freedom depends upon rendering the personal computer revolution a revolution that benefits persons rather than organizations, public and private, for the control of the persons who use computers. In the highly developed societies, everybody interacts every day with machinery which is either under their control or out of their control, that contains, transmits, receives, and reprocesses information crucial to their own definition of autonomy. Financial information, intimate conversation with persons, political activity, 
Whatever it is that we define as information about or facilitating our role as autonomous citizens of a free society now passes ineluctably through the devices controlled by software. Who controls the software controls life. Well, it had better be us. That's the real political meaning of the free software movement. As you see, we're doing pretty well. My colleague and friend, Mr. Stallman, began this movement in 1982. Twenty-two years later, we know what Rishab tells us about people all over the world, their hopes, their dreams, their ambitions collectively and individually, causing them to participate joyfully in a process of building the infrastructure of a free society and sharing it with one another. That's an extraordinary achievement in 22 years. By comparison, 22 years after the beginning of the French Revolution, a military dictatorship had taken over the Free French and was employing the Free French to fight and die in a war of European conquest thinly ascribed to the impulse to bring freedom to the downtrodden participants of the unfree societies of the old regime. Something not entirely unlike going to war, say, in Iraq, in order to bring freedom to the downtrodden members of a society over which one wishes to exercise, however very temporarily, military occupation. We have militarily occupied nothing. We have guillotined nobody. We have wasted nary a dime of venture capital financing a sin we take more seriously than the supposed founders of the new economy who wasted, as you know, more than a few dimes and sent more than a few widows and orphans home hungry. It is they who will soon forget that they were part of the new economy based upon capturing the eyeball and enslaving the consumer to an even more sophisticated system of disempowering mass communications than the television, radio, etc. they had already got. Our plans extend far beyond the software layer of the network. But it is necessary to free the software layer of the network, irretrievably to free the software layer of the network, in order to do the rest of what we intend to do. So the business of freeing the software layer of the network has become business. We have conscripted, unintentionally, I suppose you might say, some new participants in our movement, IBM, Hewlett-Packard, Motorola. Well, you know how it goes. Right? They are the unwitting running dogs of the movement of liberation <laughs> in this social movement of ours. But they're having a pretty good time, too. Because, as has been suggested, freedom is good for everybody. They're fond of saying, as the other capitalists are fond of saying, that freedom is necessary to a free economy, and they agree with us and we agree with them. It is. And they are deriving the limited economic benefits that arise from life in a free society, while they are also deriving individually and collectively the personal benefits of life in freedom. When IBM completes the work of ensuring that every IBM employee works at a free software computer in order to perform her and his daily tasks at the end of next year, they will have brought even more benefits of freedom to themselves. And in doing so, of course, as we all know, they will have begun the bringing of those benefits of freedom to the enterprise far more widely. A freedom is coming to the enterprise. Uh, that's a byproduct of freedom coming to individuals and from them to their societies. We have built this from the bottom up, haven't we? This is in some fundamental sense a children's movement. A 
feel this all the time. I am almost too old to be part of it. I shall age out shortly. I have no doubt whatever. It is a movement primarily based upon the efforts of those who learn for a living. By the middle of the 21st century, I feel fairly safe in predicting the majority of what we now call making software will be done by people we presently call students, doing something we presently call learning. The activity of figuring out which parts of the vast stream of creativity unleashed by that form of learning will then fall to enterprises, which will conduct, in effect, editorial selection of the vast range of variation created by the whole efflorescent system of people learning about the world and tinkering with it. Now, already the economics of that transformed system are becoming apparent, and Rishab and his colleagues are the single most effective students of that critical part of the crucible of the future that the world presently has. What Rishab and others have shown again and again at increasing levels of certainty as the movement takes hold is that freedom, in the sense in which we mean it, the freedom to tinker, the freedom to learn, the freedom to improve, and the freedom to share, unleashes possibilities of connection and development for society that are not achievable in an environment of the complete and exclusive ownership of ideas. When the software layer is free, culture becomes free too. The single most important music distribution system on earth is now run by 12-year-olds. Everybody knows it. Five years from now, in societies with broadband to home, the video and movie distribution system will be essentially in competition with 14-year-olds as well as 8-year-olds and will be suffering the same near-death experience presently being suffered by the music industry. That is to say that knuckle-dragging thugs who have determined that most musicians will sweep floors, wait tables, or drive taxi cabs rather than making a living from music will have been driven out of the business of deciding who makes art. This is a positive development. That in the process, people will have shared what doesn't belong to them for a little while is regrettable, and I regret it. But you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. It is the omelet we are trying to make, we set out to make, and we are succeeding in making. An environment in which the bottlenecks over distribution that have previously determined that most of the welfare gains from culture would be handed to non-creative people, those bottlenecks are being taken down. We are taking them down. The result is that the effort to create leverage over creation to make me get paid for distributing the work of someone else when it could just as easily be distributed by the people who love it themselves. That effort to bottleneck the system of human creativity is coming to an end. Free software makes that possible. The freer the software, the more possible it is. We have watched the distribution oligopolists sue out of existence, bit by bit, the unfree peer-to-peer -peer software systems, leaving themselves, as a few of us impolitely predicted for them when they began the process, leaving themselves face-to-face -face now with nothing but freedom left to squash. They have slowly maneuvered themselves past the point where mere name-calling would do the work, or past the point where the centralized directory or the eyeball-selling Napster model of how to get music could be used as a point for the repression of sharing, and they are now at war with the network itself. They will fail. Similarly, the best-funded, deepest, 
and most abusive monopoly in the history of the world is dying. Microsoft is now in a development race against free. Longhorn is where? 2006, maybe, on the client side. 2008, maybe, on the server side. This week, we hear that Microsoft believes that to run Longhorn, the average user should be using a dual-core CPU at 4 gigahertz, have a gigabyte of main memory, and a video card three times faster than the fastest stuff now on the market for consumer use. A gift, if you like, to the world's hardware manufacturers. If everybody wanted to upgrade to supercomputer workstations, which they don't. So, the monopoly, which, like all monopolies, makes low-quality goods, stifles innovation, and sells at high prices. This is what monopolies do. The monopoly now must come up with new product in a race against free. It will lose. I don't say this on behalf of the free software movement. IBM says this on behalf of IBM. That's what the Super Bowl advertisement down south where I live meant. Get used to it. Now, there will be legal warfare over this. When you have 60 billion, with a B, U.S. dollars to use to defend your monopoly, and you cannot defend it by competition, you will defend it by litigation, by disruption, by, if you will excuse me for using a word which ordinarily means um, something rather like terrorism, um, frightening people. So there will be a lot of frightening people going on. That's my work. I know about that. My job is to help clients who are frightened be less frightened. We have been thinking about this war for a decade at least, and we are ready for it. But it will be long, and it will be complex, and it will be involved, and at the other end, we're going to win. Ten years from now, people will have amnesia about the fact that they supported the best-funded, deepest, and most abusive monopoly in the history of the world, which will, for all practical purposes, have vanished. At that point, when the software layer of the network is predominantly free, there are some other things that we will be able to do. How does the software layer of the network become predominantly free? The largest acquirers of software collectively in the world are governments. They have an obligation to spend their citizens' money wisely and to contribute to the welfare of the societies of which they are stewards. As Rishabh has pointed out to you, and as you know yourself from reading the newspapers and slash dot and the <laughs> few other places where news about what we do is widely and honestly disseminated, governments are getting the point. The largest software market in the world is moving towards us at a previously unimaginable rate. When government switches to freedom, the economy moves too. George W. Bush believes that, and so do I. We're talking about different kinds of freedom, but the principle is the same. We're going to free a lot of citizens in a lot of societies around the world in the next 10 years. And that's what hurts the monopoly more than anything else. I make that prediction to you on the basis of a fairly confident experience in doing this law and some industry relations around it. But if you doubt me, an experiment is being conducted. Just watch what the monopoly does, and you will know about what it is primarily afraid. 
The owners of culture, of course, are not just the software monopolists. But they fully understand why the movement to free software threatens the oligopoly of cultural ownership. Could we have an agreement about digital rights management? Yes, we could. In fact, we explored one with the United States Senate in the course of consideration of what was known as the Hollings Bill because it kept changing its initials as Disney found a new uh, untenable political position and shifted the name of the statute they were paying Senator Hollings to make for them. The, ex the, the experiment in reaching agreement wasn't very hard. I conducted it in Washington with the assistance of many fine uh, firms that had an industrial interest in avoiding the meltdown. And it amounted to this. If you want to protect copyrighted content against certain kinds of appropriative use, which are currently against the law, let us devise technical measures which, one, can be implemented in free software, two, involve open standards and protocols only, and three, are unencumbered by patents. If you do that you can create a big tent coalition which embraces everybody from, here I find it particularly useful to be at one end point, the Free Software Foundation, to, at the other end point, the Walt Disney Company. Who boggles the deal? Not the Free Software Foundation, but the Walt Disney Company. No, no. Any implementation of rights management technology in free software is worse than nothing at all. The one thing that we must have is a system that consumers cannot understand or modify. If we have that, the game is over. Yes, you're right. When the long history of the culture wars is written some decades from now, it will be clear that the loss was self-inflicted. The owners of culture had it in their power to agree on technical measures respecting freedom in return for a heightened degree of respect for the legal principles upon which they presently emit their products, pending the inevitable movement to a much broader sharing of culture while securing respect for particular commercially proprietarily produced culture products now. History will record that it was they who rejected the deal. And what happens to them from here on out is their fault. It's not surprising. They've messed up more often than they themselves can count from Thomas Edison to now. And it's not surprising that they blew it at the end. But they have blown it. And the 12-year-olds are going to take over. <laughs> that change in the cultural distribution system in the network is one reminder of the very broad changes that arise from the freeing of the software layer in the network. It's not the only one by any means. In the United States, it is presently being learned the hard way that if you want to have electronic voting, the software has to be free. People are suddenly realizing that if you don't have free software in the voting machine, you don't have free elections anymore. That's a very useful little lesson for the United States to learn. It's another piece of the connective tissue that builds up the public recognition that there is no such thing as civil freedom without free software. Another aspect of the cultural change the free software layer brings about in the network. Hardware, not dual core, four gigahertz, one gigabyte main memory, but hardware, real hardware, is cheap. Software is free. The great question of the 21st century is what about bandwidth? Because if bandwidth isn't free, then those who own bandwidth constrain the ability of the technology to liberate people, since it is technology for communication, learning, and sharing. So we must go to a world in which bandwidth is free to share. 
That's another oligopoly, much tougher than any other opponent we have identified to this point. But there too, the basic system of social gravitation set into force by our movement will in the end triumph. Simply because the electromagnetic spectrum is no more capable of being dominated by private parties using government resources than the network on the wireline can be militarily occupied by private interests using government forces. When software is free and hardware is cheap, people begin to realize that purchasing switching capability by the hour or the minute or the call, or purchasing bandwidth out of the electromagnetic spectrum, which everybody intuitively understands is a common resource, makes no economic sense for individuals. Why do I pay phone bills? I could just as easily build neighborhood area networks and connect them together using microwave links that are now cheap and easy. We could build up the public telecommunication system and stop paying. By the middle of the third decade of the 21st century, there will be not just proof of concept and running code, but substantial free territories in the world in which all voice and data communication occurs freely on shared spectrum and has driven out the poor quality, low feature systems of telecommunications for which people pay at present. Tax cut politics will have rather little traction compared to the actual electoral politics of vote for us and we will eliminate your telephone bill, your cable bill, your internet bill, your special pay TV prices, etc., etc., etc. Subscription fees, which increasingly take more out of the average consumer paycheck than most of the discretionary government services provided to them. This also depends upon free software. Because you may be sure that proprietary software is not going to offer people the opportunity to replace the telecommunications oligopoly with build-it-yourself, pay-nothing-for-its-use telecoms services. How are we going to get there? Every one of the network devices in this room, the appliances, has free software inside. Every one of them. Every cell phone in the world in five years, every PDA will have free software inside. It's an unbeatable deal for the appliance manufacturer. But there are certain legal rules. If you put free software, GPL free software, into an appliance and you sell people the appliance, you must give them the source code. If you permit modification of the code once it is in the device, we will tell you, you must permit that modification by the user in that device. GPL version 3 will be clearer on this subject than GPL version 2 because the embedded appliance is an important subject in 2004 as it was not in 1991. No manufacturer of a consumer telecommunications device wants to sell the device in a way that renders the software inside not upgradable. It is not advantageous for the manufacturers, much less for the telecommunications and network appliance distributors, not to be able to upgrade the devices in use. Appliances are going to become free. Left to their own devices, the telecommunications oligopolists and the content owners would get together to create an eyeball selling you pay for culture by the SIP society. But they're not going to be left to their own devices. We have 
their devices. And their devices are going to work for freedom. When you have a free software PDA, turning it into a voice over IP phone is trivial. I'm just doing it to a newly purchased free software PDA now. When you have a voice over IP, music playing, video watching, free software box in your pocket, and it costs $75, you don't need to pay phone bills anymore. Oh, yeah, that 802.11 connection, oh, you're doing it all over. Don't you have to pay for that by the SIP? Well, down south where I live, the analog television frequency statutorily returned to the public in 2006. Nobody actually expects that frequency to come back to the public in 2006, but it takes an actual change to federal law to make that happen. And we're going to have an interesting fight in the next two years over that down in the States. We're going to see political movement for freeing spectrum everywhere within one generation with enormous consequences for the state of freedom in society. It's not much. It's just Mr. Gates, Mr. Eisner, Mr. Murdoch, the remaining telecommunications, state-owned monopolies, all the oligopolies. How could you beat them, all of them, within one generation? People power. People power. This is what we set out to do. To make freedom. We know what freedom is. We're not confused about it. Nobody has to explain to us what freedom is in a technological society. We have a firm grasp of the obvious, and we refuse to settle for less. We don't care who goes out of business. Our job isn't to keep people in business. Our job isn't to put people out of business. We have our eyes on the prize. This is a civil rights movement we're running here. We set out to do it. We like where it is now. We like where we mean to take it. We see that we can win. You see it too. Freedom. Now. Thank you very much.